Hi folks, welcome back to the Cannabis Corner. You know, the outside grower, other than having to worry about the wild animals like the deers and the possums and stuff, and the insects and stuff, and people finding his weed and stuff, but two of the most critical things that, that make it tough to grow outdoors is one, you can't control the sunlight, and two, you can't control the moisture as well as an indoor grow. And the further the remote the uh, outdoor grow space is, then it, the water part really becomes an issue. Now the sun, the sunlight and the sun, you're not gonna change that. And of course it, it is the change in the photo period. In other words, the amount of daylight to darkness ratio that causes the cannabis plant to flower. And that's why it's so nice indoors because you can just uh, start cutting the time back that you have on the plants growing and they will automatically start flowering. But uh, the outdoors, you don't have this luxury. So outdoor growing is very tough, but the one beauty of it is if you can get past all the critters, if you can get past all the people trying to steal it and find it, and also the DEA flying overhead, and if you're able to keep water to it, then you don't have to pay for the electricity for the grow lights because these thousand watt grow lights do, I mean, if you think about it, it's a thousand watts. So every hour that thing runs, that's one kilowatt. If you're running one light 16 hours a day during the vegetative growth state, then you're using 16 kilowatts of electricity. And in a month, that's gonna to translate to about 500 kilowatts, which if it's 10 or 12, 15 cents a kilowatt, you're looking at about 75 or hundred dollars to run that. So it's not gonna be uh, something you'd see outdoors, but the control that you have over the watering and the light indoors, of course, makes it more favorable. And you don't have people uh, finding it, you don't have animals eating it and all that. But as you, uh, once, once you get the uh, indoor crop growing and you've, you've gotten your plants to substantial height, which is probably gonna take about two months under the, uh, the metal halide light, then you'll wanna switch, uh, start cutting the light back on a normal ratios when you're growing vegetatively are about 16 hours of light versus eight hours of darkness. And of course, you wanna even this out a little bit more when you get ready to start flowering, about 10 to 12 to eight or 10 hours on the other, on the darkness side. But you'll also wanna switch the bulb on your grow light to the uh, high pressure sodium. And uh, this gives the wavelengths which are more, more suitable for the flowering process to occur and all. And uh, once you start doing this, the plants are going to start, begin to flower right away. And if you've already cloned your females and, you, and you've already cloned your plants and you know you have females, then, then there's no need to worry about the males coming in there. But if you haven't done that, keep a close eye on the male parts forming because you certainly don't want to make a bunch of seed because it's going to, it won't affect your potency if the varieties are the same, but what it will affect is the amount of smokable material you get. So uh, the seeded, cannabis if it, of that variety is the same potency as one that's not seeded. It's just that the sensimilia gives you more of the smoking part and less seed. And so you don't want the male, if you do have a male crop up in there, believe me, one pollen, all it'll take is one pollen grain and he'll take care of business with all the rest of the females. But, and even the females themselves, we talked about the hermaphrodism some several weeks ago and we, and they, they themselves are capable of producing the pollen. But fortunately that it, the only the XX portion of the chromosomes are given up when the female does it. So, but you, those are things you want to watch for. But once the, the the pistillate hairs, the little white hairs, start forming on the female and all, you probably want to let this go like this for about four to four to six weeks. Uh, some growers, this is going to vary from grower to grower and, and and varieties and whatnot. And really, what you're trying to achieve and how tall you got the plant to grow vegetatively, there's a lot of factors just, to just say one specific set of things rules is not going to work for every grower and and there are certain growers they they want to do the budding phase a lot quicker so they can get their product yields quicker and that's understandable but you just have to be diligent but once the uh, pistillate hairs have, have formed and you're and you're looking at really nice flower tops that are formed on the top of the plant and all then the uh, as they get closer to maturity and becoming mature the uh, resin is going to start building inside these glands inside these pistillate hairs and all and this is what gives the reddish orange colors and things that we see in those and once once that ratio of, of clear white uh, you, you kind of have to just kind of watch those pistillate hairs, but you'll start to see them kind of turn in a rust color and you don't want to let them go complete. The, the bud's probably about the best. I mean, you can smell it and pinch it and use all those techniques to, to determine when the exact time for ripeness is. But usually a good rule of thumb on that is when about 50% of the hair that's showing is, is showing this orange color. And then you know pretty much that the, uh, f the plants are mature. 
Now, one of the important phases after you've harvested the buds, now you, you want, you'll want to cut the buds loose from the flower tops and, and hang them up into a drying situation. I, I think uh, putting them along a line where they can hang upside down and, and, and dry gradually, you don't, want, you, want to, you don't want to dry them too quickly and all, but do a gradual drying on them. And then once you get the buds completely dry where you feel like that most of the water is out of them, because folks, until the decarboxylation occurs, the, the cannabis, the actual tetrahydrocannabinol that gets you high, the psychoactive part that, you, that you're smoking it for, it will not occur as long as there's water still in those buds. So you have to, you really have to let that de decarboxylate stage occur. And then the transformation into the tetrahydrocannabinol will result. But at getting the buds dry is just the first stage of this. Then you have to cure the buds. And this is very, a very important phase. <clears throat> really good sensome or good marijuana that's grown can be ruined during the curing phase if it's not done properly. <clears throat> One of the best methods, now if, you're, if you have a tremendous grow area and, and all, this is going to be quite a feat. But for the normal grower who has a small grow area and stuff, after the buds are dried, the, the, one of the best methods to do this is to take those and place them inside of a paper bag and then put that inside of a plastic bag and leave the plastic bag open but roll the paper bag up and allow those to cure like this for s several more days. You can you can kind of test it and all and, and your personal testing, you, you, there may be the curing phase is going to bring out these delicacies in flavor. It's going to make sure that the maximum amount of THC has been made available through the decarboxylate phase. So the, the curing technique is, is pretty much, it's, it's one that is very specific, but, but certain growers do it differently. This method I just described to you is just one of the simpler ways to do it, but there, there are several ways you can do it. And, and there are lots of videos on, on YouTube and whatnot that, that detail this process, even detail the entire growing phase and whatnot. And certainly those can be great reference points. But, but for yourself personally, learn from it as you grow. It's just like when you're growing corn or tomatoes and stuff, and when you go out there to harvest your corn or your tomatoes, there's a specific time, a, a given window there, where, where ripeness is just right on the money. It's perfect. And cannabis is no different. It has a specific time when it's growing that, that the ripeness occurs. And one thing that you can do about indoor growing, once you've harvested the uh, buds and stuff, you can turn the vegetative lights back on, put the metal halide bulbs back in, and start the 16 hour a day growing again, and get the, those plants to reflower again. They will, they will continue to do this process as long as you've kept plenty of nutrients to them. If they've rooted out in the containers you've got them in, if you're growing organic, bump them into bigger containers and give them more soil, but you can continue these. There are, there are plants in Mexico that are 25 years old and they're, they're trees and they, they do this very thing. Thing. They naturally do that there because of the, the growing conditions and whatnot. They're able to do that. But, but you can get these same plants. You don't have to restart new plants over and over. It's fun to do, and it's something that will certainly ensure the progeny if you have, if you have specific seed that, of a variety that you are growing. But this way, and you can clone you know, more and more females once you get the females going. It's very simple matter to, to clone uh, more plants and that way you ensure that you do have female plants. So take advantage of these, uh, of this growing phase and learn, uh, particularly in the, once the plants start to flower and whatnot. The vegetative state is gonna be, you know, it's one of interest and stuff and you'll learn from that. But once the plant begins to flower and then you get closer to maturity and then the harvesting and the curing and all, this is really when you get into the meat of the matter for growing cannabis and all. So learn from those experiences because every time you do a crop and all, there, there will be things, it's just like gardening, when you're doing organic gardening and stuff, you learn new techniques each time and this is, this is no different. And so take advantage of those and, and teach yourself to become a master grower because eventually cannabis will be legal and we will be allowed to grow our crops and hopefully we can do these outdoor then and save the electricity bill. But if you can set up a solar array of about four of these solar panels, this will give you the thousand watts per hour that you need to run one light and you could probably grow 25 or 30 plants with the one light. So a solar deal would be great because you wouldn't have the power usage. And a lot of people get caught because their electric bills go through the roof because of the amount of 
juice they're using it all. So solar setups are, are a good thing, or generators, but uh, eventually, hopefully, we won't have to deal with the DEA and we can grow outdoors and indoors and really do some really, really exotic growing. And so this effort here of these, this growing measures and stuff, I encourage everybody to do that. Yes, it is illegal, but you know what? The DA is not budging. We've been on them for 40 something years to take cannabis off the Controlled Substance Act. It's not happening. So get out there and grow, folks. Just be careful. Be aware of the laws in your state. Remember, one plant is the equivalent of one pound in most states. If you get caught with 50 plants, whether they're seedlings or at full maturity, they will look at you as if you got caught with 50 pounds and you're looking at maximum jail time, felony charges in, in prison. So be aware of all that. But the main thing is, just like we said when we first started out the first video of these three, the main thing is do not reveal your grow space to anyone and I sure appreciate you joining the Cannabis Corner.